where you live. Now face north. Think about direction. Wonder why you haven't before. Now stand in the place where you work. Now face west. Think about the place where you live. Wonder why you haven't before. Your feet are going to be on the ground. Your head is there to move you around. If wishes were trees, the trees would be falling. Listen to reason. Season is calling. Now, when R.E.M. Uh, wrote those uh, lyrics, came out in 1988, believe it or not, uh, they probably were not thinking of federal standing doctrine. However, uh, those lyrics, which of course sound absolutely nothing like that when put to music, came to mind when I was preparing for the show this week because we're going to be talking all about Article 3 and standing doctrine in the Constitution here on Short Circuit, your podcast on the Federal Courts of Appeals. I'm your host, Anthony Sanders, director of the Center for Judicial Engagement at the Institute for Justice. Joining me are two powerhouse standing expert attorneys, well, who also know some other things, who work with me at the Institute for Justice. You've heard them before, and I'm very happy to have them both back. They are Kirby West and Andrew Ward. Welcome to both of you. Hey, good to be here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Great. So um, we are talking about two uh, two opinions this week that the underlying matters are incredibly banal and non-controversial. Um, one has to do with an abortion drug and one has to do with schools and transgender policies. Um, you know, two things that we can all agree on, of course, it's just the, the standing part that, you know, might get some, some flare ups and arguments. So first, we're going to start in the Fifth Circuit, which is what Andrew is going to talk about. Some of you may have heard about this in the news. It has to do with um, a controversial drug uh, that induces abortions and whether the FDA properly approved it and whether a, a group of doctors properly could challenge it. And then we're going to move on to a challenge to a school policy about informing or not informing parents when children are doing a gender transition of sorts. Uh, and Kirby's going to take it away in the Fourth Circuit. So let's start in the Fifth with Andrew. And if you can tell us about this uh, banal set of facts and uh, a ra rather complicated issue of standing. Uh, you know, you joke, Anthony, but this is actually the perfect case for short circuit because it has no real world impact whatsoever. It is so hot button that the Supreme Court has already said that nothing is going to go into effect. Uh, the Supreme Court, it is normally a long shot to say that a case uh, is something the justices are going to want to handle. They are going to take this case, I confidently predict, and we will actually get a result from them probably you know, sometime in uh, June, uh, it's all just, it's all just, uh, it's dicta. The whole thing is just opinions for lawyers. <laughs> so it's a great thing to talk about on short circuit. My other, my other question was going to be, why is the fifth circuit even doing this? Isn't what the fifth circuit itself is doing, like not even right. But like that's kind of a meta question on top of everything. I, I I don't know. They're providing guidance. They're, they're giving the Supreme court the, the benefit of, of the circuit's views. Uh, I, I don't know. There are many questions one could ask about this case, like why is regulatory drug approval being raised in Amarillo? I think it's Amarillo, somewhere in the Northern District of Texas, and it's because they know that it's a single, just, single judge district. But anyway, all these things about currents in um, <laughs> the intersection of politics and the courts are neither here nor there for the moment. So what actually happened in this case? Um, well, it, as you said, it is a group of pro-life doctors challenging uh, the FDA's approval of mifepristone, which is one of the drugs in the two-drug cocktail that is frequently um, used uh, to do medication induced as opposed to surgical abortion. And basically, the doctors challenge everything about this. They challenge the fact that the FDA approved this drug in 2000. Um, they challenged that in the mid 2010s, it loosened the use restrictions. Um, they challenged that it loosened them again as a result of COVID. Um, and basically what the Fifth Circuit, uh, in an opinion by Judge Elrod, ends up saying is that the challenge to the original approval is time barred. The district court had actually issued a sweeping ruling saying it's all gone, you know, this this drug is 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 no good. What happens at this circuit is that 
the challenge to the approval as a whole is time barred. Uh, the the plaintiffs are bringing it too late after the the six year statutory limit uh, for a two thousand action, but there is. Um, standing to challenge, and, and we'll talk about sort of the substance first, the um, 2016, I believe it was, and 2021 changes. So the 2016 changes um, raise the gestational age from seven weeks to 10, make it so that the pill can be descri- uh, prescribed by medical professionals other than doctors, and some other changes as well, but those are the two major ones. Um that first one, by the way, as long as we're talking about on this show just everything that shouldn't come up at dinner for like <laughs> a brief obstetric digression for the the men in the audience that might not be aware, right? The way because of modern obstetric idiosyncrasy that pregnancy is counted, right? Pregnancy is actually happening at two weeks of pregnancy. Pregnancy is probably going to be found out at four weeks of pregnancy for a median woman. So when we say seven and 10 weeks, we're talking about three to six weeks um, sort of from a woman realizing she's she's pregnant, a, a, a median woman realizing she's she's pregnant, um, and the court says that both of these actions are inappropriate, uh, are you know arbitrary and capricious. I think is the uh, Administrative Procedure Act language, um, and basically the reasoning is that in the 2016 one, although the FDA studied the various things it wanted to change individually, it didn't really study them together. Um, And then the 2021 one is sort of a result of what happened in 2016 and and various data reporting issues. And they basically say, you don't really know that this is safe enough. So you have to go back and do it again. Um, And so we're back to sort of the original mifepristone regime as it existed in 2000. Although again, all of this is on pause until the Supreme Court gets to weigh in. Um, Judge Ho has a has a pretty interesting concurrence uh, uh, talking about something called the Comstock Act, which we can mention, which at least on its face just totally makes it illegal to mail abortifacients in the first place. That seems to be what the plain text says, but the majority doesn't reach that. Um, but but maybe the bigger takeaway from this opinion, particularly as as it applies to standing, but even in general, is like abortion affects everything. So th- they even talked about this in Dobbs, the case that overturned Roe v. Wade, that it that the idea of abortion has had all these effects on other areas of law that are unrelated. Um, and I think that's exactly right. Like like if um if there's no brighter star in our constitutional constellation uh, than the First Amendment right of conscience, uh, that's a line from West Virginia versus Barnett. Abortion is basically the black hole of our constitutional <laughs> constellation, like relativistically warping everything that goes near it, like stretching out, spaghettifying, actual word in physics, uh, like all the law that goes near it, like stretching it to the breaking point. Um, and I think that's basically what happened in the court's standing analysis. So as a basic reminder, right, under Article Three's case or controversy requirement, not just anyone can sue about anything that he or she doesn't like or that thinks might be in violation of the law. You need to be personally affected by it. Um, and, you know, that's that's obvious in like a car crash, like you hit me with your car. Now you owe me money because you hurt me or something like that. But it it doesn't apply to something like a fairly abstract injury of like maybe the government might be intercepting my communications. Um uh, because of like international national security surveillance or something like it's got to be concrete. It's got to be, you know, tangible rather than abstract. It needs to be actually likely to happen. Um, and what the doctors here say is like, well, it's basically statistically certain that some women will be going to the emergency room after taking mifepristone. And, you know, this affects us because, but then after that, it gets a little hazy. <laughs> um, they say a couple different things. They say that they might be forced to complete an abortion, like an incomplete abortion where the drug doesn't take, so to speak, um, and do that in violation of their conscience rights. Uh, they claim that the whole thing is just sort of like very upsetting. The Fifth Circuit, even even the Fifth Circuit's opinion rejects that one. Um, they say that they're distra- they could be distracted by these injuries from treating other patients. They say that a 
their malpractice rates uh, could go up because these are dangerous procedures. And, and they say they have before, right? Like they, they've well, actually been no, in the emergency room a few no, times with these kind no, of women. No, they don't really say that. <laughs> um, you know, there's there's there was actually a whole uh, colloquy at oral argument about just the passive voice because one of the doctors that the Fifth Circuit relies on says, you know, like I have personally treated 12 women who required and then various procedures that I object to. But she never actually says, like it's written in the passive, she never says that she is the person who performed those procedures. Um, and there's there's all just a general sense of like, well, it's possible. Like I have seen it could happen that. Um, but I would say that it, it's it's a it's a stretch under existing standing doctrine anyway um, to really know that these doctors that people will come into their specific hospitals the members of these organizations that they will have to do things that they don't want to do um, none of them ever actually say they have had to do they personally clearly have had to do something they don't want to do they talk about other people and I maybe see. it could happen to them. Um, now, at oral argument, their lawyer said she was referring to herself. She, She's not a lawyer, so she just wrote it that way. I tend to think the declarations are written by the lawyers, but who knows? Um, but, it, but it's all just a little loosey-goosey. They don't say anything about actual malpractice rates going up. Um, the idea that treating a patient is in and of itself an injury because then you can't treat a different patient just seems to sound like all of being a doctor is an injury. Um, and I'm not going to sit here actually and tell you that any of this is wrong. I'm a plaintiff's attorney and I mostly hate standing doctrine. Uh, I think by and large, it's like a scam to keep meritorious claims out of court. However, I will say that this standing holding appears to be consistent with broader standing precedent, particularly a Supreme Court case that is discussed in, in um, the opinion that says you really can't make sort of just pure statistical claims. There needs to be an identifiable specific person um, that needs to be have some likelihood of harm in the future. Now, the, the Fifth Circuit says that's not really what that case means, but it kind of seems like it's what it, it it's what it means. Um, and it all just seems a little goosey, loosey-goosey to me. A and if I may, like, it's hard to see this happening in a case that is not about abortion. Um, here at the Institute for Justice, you know, I'm going to get in a case right now where the Fourth Circuit's about to hear oral argument. Um, it's about our client who hit a police officer in 2004. And many years later, he went to work as a substance abuse counselor. Um, it turns out that that is illegal because he has this conviction for assault on a public official. And in 2017, Virginia said this person has to be fired from his job. He is legally banned for life. He has to be fired. His employer did fire him. He is now subject to that lifetime ban. Um, every day of his life, he wants to be working as a substance abuse counselor. He instead works as a trucker. That's how he supports his family because what he wants to do is a crime if he gets hired. Um, the district court in that case ruled that he did not have standing because it is theoretically possible that one day the governor of Virginia might, might pardon him, which would remove the injury. So we don't really know that he is injured. Um, that is a question the Fourth Circuit is going to take up in October. I have a hard time thinking um, that if these doctors who have seen other people affected by things that hurt their consciences in the past, and at some point in the future, some of the women who, yes, are statistically sir to come to the hospital might come into the hospital where they work and nobody else will be available, and they're the only ones who can possibly be there to complete that abortion that didn't happen, that's why that's there as an emergency. And all of this is directly attributable to the changes about seven to 10 weeks or non-doctor prescribers or it coming through the mail, not just the approval. It can't be due to mifepristone. It needs to be due to the things that they actually challenged that they had that weren't time barred, that all of that is likely to happen. Uh, it's a hard time seeing that happening in, in a case uh, that is not about abortion. So is the level of disregard for the agency. I think that's a little bit unlikely too. But uh, yeah, abortion, it's a black hole. It changes all the law around it. I have something that is not necessarily a disagreement, but maybe a a broadening of uh, or a, a different perspective on Andrew's point that this is unique to an abortion case. And I think it's um, 
because this reminds me a little bit, right, of uh, Judge Ho talks about in his concurrence, something that brought a lot of attention online about the aesthetic injury to doctors who um, appreciate caring for unborn babies and are hurt by the fact of abortion. And, and I also was unclear, Anthony, I think I misinterpreted some of the declarations as well. I thought one of the doctors had a, a patient come in at nine weeks with a healthy pregnancy and then later be treated for uh, the for after uh, <clears throat> side effects of the abortion, but I might have missed that, Andrew. The digression on the uh, the passive versus the active voice there, and it was a ninety three <clears throat> page opinion, and, right? And Andrew, I think has read it a little more carefully. Uh, That's than, very than us, true. I, I defer to Andrew on that factual point. I don't know if you should, though. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's well, pretty complicated. Uh, but what what uh, the aesthetic argument? Obviously you know, harkens to some of the environmental cases. And so we have, for example, the court, the Supreme Court has said that the desire to use or observe an animal species, even for purely aesthetic purposes, is undeniably a cognizable injury for the purpose of standing. And so what Judge Ho talks about is, okay, if it's if it's the case that your desire to pretend to see a uh, animal species, and you don't know for sure when you go to these protected areas if you're going to see that animal species, but your desire to see it and the fact that you will go to those spaces, you know, you have uh, an injury because it's less likely that you're going to get to see them if whatever environmental harm comes to pass. Um, and so Judge Ho says, well, similarly, these doctors, they love babies. They love unborn babies and they delight in caring for patients who are pregnant because of their um, aesthetic value of these unborn babies. And I think this rings false to people often because they just don't really believe that the aesthetic value is that great, both on on either side of these things, the environmental or the abortion cases. I think people kind of roll their eyes like, oh, really? You love the snail darter that much? Or, oh, really, doctor? You're getting that much joy out of the sonogram image? Um, but I don't know. I'm like a little bit less skeptical in both situations. But I think why people kind of roll their eyes is it seems like what the court is really doing is almost like a Lorax theory of standing, like who will speak for the trees. It's like there's something here that has some kind of interest that can assert the interest itself. You know, the snail darter can't get standing in a federal court. The unborn baby can't get standing in a federal court. And so the court's like, ah, oh, there's kind of this thing. So maybe we can give the standing to someone else and they can take the case for this other thing that we can't give standing to, which isn't a thing. And the court shouldn't be able to do that. Um, and I think that's why people in in these cases feel like, I don't know. That's it. Is what you're is what you're asserting, court? Really, what's happening? Is this really the rationale for finding standing here? Um, but again, that said, I'm kind of sympathetic to the like. I am affected by this. You know, I I I am I am not unconvinced in either case that people are truly. Uh, you know, don't have an injury in these in these situations. And I, I actually, I actually, I actually am too. Um, th this got a ton of flack online. Like, well, if if you know Jim can't see the majestic bald eagle in the in the wild, then like surely Doctor Pro Life should get to see that smiling baby. And I actually think it's probably intellectually correct that those are both injuries. Um, but I think I would still dispute the um the sort of the likelihood of it as to any particular identifiable person that you could say that um, because of the like these specific regulatory changes, you know that a member – like obviously big picture, the existence of abortion. Like you could just say that like pro-life doctors get less business because of the existence of abortion. This is clearly true in the um, – in the aggregate, but that any particular person in this organization is likely to be harmed by these regulatory changes. I I take that I take tough. that point, and I think you're right that that is tough. But I think that that's equally true in the context of environmental cases, right? Like endangered species are endangered because they're very rare, and so it your chance of seeing endangered species is already kind of low. And then can you show that the decreased likelihood in being able to see an endangered species is because of a specific regulatory policy? Like, I think you have a similar kind of difficult chain of events, and I think it. I think it's probably 
true. The only thing that I know is true is that courts should say either both are fine or both are not fine. I think one of the big frustrations with standing doctrine is it's just terribly inconsistent, as we will see uh, coming up. And um, I think I think that's where a lot of my frustration stems. But I'm not like I don't know. I just uh, I, I I take Andrew's point on a lot of it, but I'm not t- totally unsympathetic. Uh, just as a matter of consistency, that I don't know. Maybe there is there is something here. Well, we'll see what happens when oral argument at the Supreme Court is in like March, April, probably. Get a decision in June, and we'll see in 2024 how to uh, how to resolve all this. Well, that I I think that's a really interesting question because I could see two completely different things happening when this case gets to the court on standing. One is it could be a chance for some of the newer justices and and some of the the ones who have been there a while who don't agree with some of those like environmental decisions to just sweep everything clean and throw these doctors overboard, but also throw a lot of, you know, other folks and other ideological points of view, like a lot of environmental groups overboard. Or we could have this black hole of abortion, as you say, Andrew, and we would just get a lot more standing, but in ways that, you know, a lot of people um, don't like of of, of various persuasions. I, I think you're both, I mean, I think you both have a good point that that especially as civil rights attorneys, if we were writing on a blank slate, there probably would be some standing here. Um, but given how a lot of cases end up, including cases I've litigated and where there's not standing and there's a lot shorter chain of events like Andrew was talking about, um, I can't see how these people have standing. I mean, under their theory, you could have you could have standing to sue car companies because you're going to have I mean, any ER doctor has treated people who were in a car accident. So if you had some nuisance lawsuit that like you can't have cars because people start having accidents, of course, on the merits, you'd lose. But on standing, how could you not have standing and, and say you hate cars? And when people come in, it's like it reminds you of those damn cars. And so you get pissed off. And how do you not have standing under this theory? This we are totally going to have like, right. When SB8 happened in Texas, the sort of private bounties for abortion, Gavin Newsom said they're going to do it for guns. Surely there is some group of anti-gun ER doctors who will also have standing. Um, This happens when, you know, like states ban um, gender affirming care. Other states respond. um, Well, actually, I think it happened uh, the other way first. But, you know, like these the doctrines are trans substantive. right? Right. So like as soon as you empower one side, you empower the other side, too. Yeah. Sorry, I, I agree. I think it's it definitely opens the door to all of those cases, which we I think we will see. Um, one of the other things I think that kind of warps standing doctrine is – so we'll get to this in the next case. Um, but the discussion – a discussion of is it right for a court to decide something or is this proper – more proper for a legislative body or for the electorate to decide – and when you're dealing with things within administrative agencies like this case, it's kind of hard to affect those things through the ballot box, right? Like the person that – the representatives that you elect have very little impact on what's happening within the FDA. And so I think that that um, – insulation of agencies from the actual impact of decisions by the electorate and and you know you you can't impact them it leads to a pressure into the courts to open up standing doctrines so that they can be res- these issues can be resolved somewhere and maybe it should have been resolved in the electoral process but we need to deal with it in the court instead so i think that there are kind of these background forces that are uh uh, spaghettifying, as Andrew said, our standard standing doctrine that's not only abortion. You know, that black hole line, by the way, comes from uh, our colleague Jeff Rose, lest I lest I claim the credit myself. It's it's his. Well, line, we should have guessed. <laughs> well, let's uh let's travel away from the black hole and towards a very different place, the Fourth Circuit. Um most of us would agree, where uh Kirby is going to uh bring us to this this other uh, totally non-controversial subject. Yeah, keeping it really light today. Um, so in the Fourth Circuit, we have John and Jane Doe parents versus the Montgomery County Board of Education. And so what's happening in Montgomery County is that the school district has enacted a policy where um, children who are uh, gender dysphoric or, or questioning their gender 
um, can develop with school officials a gender support plan. And that plan includes things like changing their legal name, or not their legal name, changing their name that they're called within the school, changing their pronouns, what locker rooms they're going to use, what bathrooms they're going to use. Um, and as part of this plan, the student rates how supportive they feel their family is going to be of the proposed changes in their gender or proposed changes in how they're um, you know, accessing various services within the school. And if the student says that the, parent, the family is not going to be very supportive, the school can then choose to keep the family are the parents out of the gender support plan entirely. And what that looks like is not just that they don't mention to the parents that the student has changed their name and their pronouns and what facilities they're using, but also some like active subterfuge. Like they advise that teachers should continue using the old name and pronouns on any forms that go home, um, even though in, in the classroom they should be using the updated names and pronouns. And they even go so far to say that in a situation where they feel parents are unsupportive, um, if the family specifically asks, the school can essentially lie and say, no, there is no gender support plan. Um, there are, uh, uh, in the, the record here, they say there are 300 families that for which are 300 students for which Montgomery County has chosen not to involve the parents in the gender support plan. And so this was challenged by, uh, these John and Jane Doe parents, um, and, what they said is, you know, we have a fundamental right to control the upbringing and uh, education of our children, which is a a, a, a well-established right under the 14th Amendment. Um, and they said, you know, we have a right to know what's going on and this, this policy violates that. Uh, but their claims were rejected because of a lack of standing. And so what the Fourth Circuit said is, listen, we have no reason to – think that your children are developing a gender support plan. You never alleged that they had developed a gender support plan. You never alleged that your children even were, you know, gender nonconforming or questioning their gender in any way, or they were particularly likely to, to develop a gender support plan. And so because we don't know that you specifically have been injured, even though Judge Quattlebaum says he thinks the policy is perhaps repugnant, the, the, these parents don't have standing to actually challenge um, that policy. And then in dissent, Judge Niemeyer takes a broader look at what the actual claims alleged are. So what Judge Quattlebaum um, and, and the majority here say is that the claim alleged was specifically um, the parents' right to know what was happening here. And Judge Niemeyer says, no, what the claim actually is, is the parents are alleging that the, the school district has usurped their role as parents. And they have a fundamental right as parents to be in charge of these sensitive conversations about sexual identity and gender identity. Um, and that just by creating this plan and the existence of this opportunity for parent for children to um, kind of develop this and go down this path without their parents knowing that the the school district has usurped that role and that in itself is an injury that the the parents have suffered. Um, so wildly different view of standing than uh, than we discussed in the last case, and. Um, I think it's particularly interesting here where the whole problem with the policy, right, is that you don't know if your kid is in the policy. And that's something that was alleged in the complaint is that parents said, we don't know. For all we know, our children might be in a gender support plan. There would be no way for us to know for sure whether or not they were. Um, and still, the court says, sorry, no standing unless you can say, you know, that your kids are actually, you know, being subject to this policy in some way. And bringing up, uh, by the way, bringing up the very case that was distinguished from the other case, this Clapper case about um, whether the government is listening to your communications or not, but you can't figure out if the government is actually listening to your communications. So, Andrew, uh, how how would you put these two cases together, or is that humanly possible? Um. Well, I, I mean, the re the real the real comparison, right, would be that like, to, if you really wanted to see if they would come out the same way, is that parents in Montgomery County, where I went to Biddle and uh, and high, 
No, no, my whole life. Where I went to school <laughs> growing up, um, it's been a long time. So, you know, got to gotta double check my facts. Um, right. What they should do is get uh, some concerned parents together, make sure at least somebody in the plan has a kid that was affected by these things, um, even if he or she won't be again, but someone with a past injury, and then just get enough parents, right? Because like, even if one in a thousand kids is going to go into one of these plans, um, which I don't know, that sounds like sociologically plausible. Um, in an organization with a thousand families, uh, that is a more than 50% chance that at least one family, if I did my back of the envelope math, you know, before we started this show, it is, you know, more likely than not that at least one family in the organization would then have a child um, in the plan. So that is the situation where I think then you would really see if the Fourth Circuit would be willing to follow the Fifth Circuit. And based on the panel, I'll bet they totally wouldn't. But, uh, <laughs> You know, that's uh, I, I like this opinion. It, both the actually both the majority and the dissent, I think, are like clearly right on standing. They just disagree about how to interpret the complaint, which I don't know. I I, I don't care. <laughs> I take no position on that. Um, but but these are much more traditional applications of uh, of standing. I think just a very standard like you don't know this is a problem for you, so you know take take it up at a school board meeting. Yeah, I think uh, one of the interesting things that we didn't talk about was that um, both the majority and dissent talk about the parents involved in the community school versus Seattle case from 2007. And there, the Supreme Court said that parents had standing for an equal protection challenge to a race-based school assignment policy, even though they hadn't even applied for school yet, just because in the equal protection context, being forced to compete in a race-based system, which they would have as they applied for schools, um, is an injury. And so what the dissent says is similarly here, these parents are in this system that exists and the policy has put and put into place that is, you know, unconstitutional. And what the majority says in response to that is this is just an equal protection case. This is a a quirk of um, equal protection law and that kind of standing analysis just doesn't apply in other contexts. And I think it kind of, Andrew is right, that kind of comes back again to just the differing views of what the claims are here, right? Because if you do take this kind of broader view of what the claim is, then I don't know that I don't know that it is that different than the the equal protection thing. And I think that the court is right that the, so far that's only been um, used in equal protection cases. But also I think the court discounts a little bit that the the right to control the upbringing and education of one's children, the Supreme Court has described as perhaps the oldest fundamental liberty interest recognized by the court. And that's something that, uh, you know, we didn't get into the merits at all, but that's something that I think the the district court really erred on is that the district court did not kick this on standing. The district court evaluated this on the merits and applied rational basis review um, and said, if this easily passes rational basis review, this is totally fine. And then standing came up later on appeal. Um, but I, yeah, again, I think, uh, I think when you, when you look at how the policy is implemented and that parents are being subjected to it by force, like they don't, have an option. It applies to every student. It does kind of um, seem analogous to me to the the equal protection context of being forced into the system. What I'm hearing from Kirby is that the rational basis test is bad and school choice is good. But you know, those are those are those are maybe issues for a uh, for for a different IJ. Uh, How did you production. know? <laughs> well, without getting into school choice is good, which of course is true. Um, I I th I thought that that kind of glossing over the merits and that the dissent gets more into was actually a, a really interesting subject that we don't see all that much in litigation. And that's this kind of broader idea that, that you can't challenge, like you, uh, we've had a lot of news, right, the last couple of years about school curricula, and you can't challenge what a public school is teaching real most of the time because it's just the public school providing right, and education to the parents. And so, it, like, they don't have a fundamental right for you to teach, you know, Hamlet, but not Othello or, you know, whatever the nitty gritty is of the of the curriculum. But there are certain things that schools do that goes beyond just, like, 
you know, the three R's, one of which is <laughs> helping your child transition to a different gender. And so that's where it merges into this other, this more fundamental right, which we've talked about here on Short Circuit and the Center for Judicial Engagement a lot recently, which is the um, the right identified in Meyer versus Nebraska 100 years ago to direct the upbringing of your child. And so when a school, when a public school is forcing you, right, the state forces you to attend the school, your child to attend the school, and then they start doing things like gender transitioning uh, assistance, then it gets into this fundamental right and not this just, this is just how we teach things and don't bother us because, you know, the state has an interest in educating children. And um, usually that doesn't come up much uh, because, you know, uh, you you can't litigate about the every jot and tittle that um, the curriculum offers. But it's an interesting, I think, view into that. Uh, and we'll probably, you know, as this kind of litigation happens more, we'll probably get more cases where there actually is standing, um, where this is going to be uh, an issue, some of which are already, you know, in the courts. They're just, they got children that actually were subject to a policy like this, un un unlike in this case. Yeah, I think that was one of the crazy things about the district court opinion is that they equated this to kind of curriculum choices that they said, oh, this is kind of like what the school's deciding to teach about issues of gender and sexuality. It's like, no, this is, you know, transitioning, transitioning socially is like a, what, you know, doctors who are treating kids and therapists who are treating kids would maybe prescribe as like, you know, a part of uh, treatment for gender dysphoric kids. Um, but I think tying the merits to the standing issue a little bit, one of the problems with this view of standing is that the people who um, – and I think this is true in the government surveillance cases too, right, where you can say like, well, if your kid was – questioning their gender. You would probably know. You would probably know that maybe your kid is at some kind of r increased risk for this and you know, you would have some kind of indication. And similarly you might say, well, you know, but maybe you're doing something that the government you think the government is surveilling you because you're doing some crimes or something like that. It's like, but in both cases, the situation where you legitimately have no reason to think that this is happening, but it is actually happening, would be the most problematic cases of all, right? Because it's like, well, my, you know, the government, I'm doing literally nothing wrong and the government's surveilling me. Or, you know, my kid is totally acting in, in accordance with their gender, their, you know, gender that we thought they had at home and everything seems fine. But then at school, there's like this huge problem. And I have no idea. I had no way of knowing that this was a possibility. And so in both cases, this kind of standing, like the people who have uh, kind of the worst injury of all have no way to redress it. Some countries don't have standing. That would be an interesting judicial system. <laughs> Well, don't have standing that you can't sue at all or you could sue over. No, everything. You, yeah, you just yeah, no, the second one. It's like, I don't like that. I'm going to yeah. sue. Well, some states, of course, have looser standing doctrines. Um, and some of those also don't make a lot of sense at times, but at least they have uh, kind of more public policy exceptions and and all that kind of thing. You know, one thing we, we didn't. <laughs> the pro-life doctors are taxpayers and the FDA is funded by taxpayer right. money. Give them, give them standing that way. <laughs> Yeah, taxpayer standing is always is always fun, and uh, that comes up in in some IJ cases. But one thing we we didn't talk about earlier, and is always I don't know, this is just maybe something to end on is is always a something I think the federal courts don't quite know what to deal with is where Congress or the legislature grants standing in a way that maybe isn't quite a kosher under Article Three. Um, because, of course, so you need standing under Article 3, case or controversy of the United States Constitution, but you also need a right to get into court, which is something that we talk about all the time when it comes to, um, you know, suits against uh, for damages against government officials. And our project on immunity and accountability is is dealing is dealt with that a lot. Um, and so in, in a lot of states have this odd doctrine that you need you need. I mean, it's just odd because if you compare it with federal doctrine, so you need standing under the state constitution to get in the state court or the legislature can give standing. And if the legislature gives standing, like say a taxpayer suit about, uh, you know, 
uh, bonds being issued illegally by your city or your school district or something like that, then you have standing, even if maybe you wouldn't under the under the Constitution. Um, that's not true in federal law, but sometimes it kind of seems like it is because a lot of these environmental lawsuits, right, under federal environmental law, you can tell Congress, at least when it passed it, seemed to want this kind of, you know, wild suit by an environmental group that just didn't like, you know, that trees were being cut down and maybe the uh, the Forest Service was playing playing footsie with the forest companies. And so that's a way that we're going to enforce the law instead of just having the federal government, you know, deal with it. Even if maybe that wouldn't be okay under Article 3. So it's, it seems like it kind of moves the needle because Congress was doing this. Whereas actually under the doctrine, that's not supposed to be the case. And, and that you could argue maybe some of that is going on with cases like the uh, where the FDA is involved. That, that sounds right. And, and you know, the, not just very likely the Mifepristone case, but there is already uh, a case on the court's docket for next term about testers uh, under the fair housing right. laws. That's that's a standing case. Um, I think there is quite a bit of division on the underlying issues that involved in these cases. We can all agree that standing is amorphous and weird. Yes, totally agree. And perhaps way too big a question for the very tail end of our session. But Anthony, as our kind of like resident IJ historian, I am curious of what I, I don't really know what the kind of original understanding of cases and controversies is. I've never really known that because it doesn't matter so much in the way that the laws are applied by the courts and the way that we uh, evaluate if standing exists or not. But what like what do you if you can say succinctly what do you think is kind of what is meant by cases or controversies in article 3 that is a great question which smarter people than me have written about uh and unfortunately off the top of my head right now i don't remember the exact answer but there are you know people have gone different ways on this uh of course a lot of the uh, cases or controversy the actual words um, I think is a little bit more mysterious than what, say, the English courts did at the time the Constitution was founded, which is usually how that's interpreted, right? So, did was there stand, was there a maybe standing is the wrong word, but could you bring bring a a case uh, in the either the the King's Bench or the Court of Chancery or some court of the old system? At or, or in the States at the time the Constitution was founded. Um, I've always thought that case or controversy textually seems broader than just, you know, a regular lawsuit because it's case or controversy. Um, and I think some people have argued that it's really a term of art, so it just means a lawsuit. Um, but uh, memory uh, fails me on what that is. So what we should do, Kirby is have a episode soon where we talk about those things. Maybe we, may even we might kick it over to our, our new podcast, Unpopular, or not Unpopular, it's very popular, Unpublished Opinions, <laughs> and uh, and we could talk about it there. But um, yeah, es essentially, a lot of the, the rules about, you know, having a dog in the fight and, you know, uh, not just suing about anything you, you might, be worried about and having it be material to you. That was a thing under, you know, the English legal system, but the exact bounds of it are all um, uh, murky, uh, especially so, when it comes to the court of chancery, when, when we have in, injunctions and injunctive relief. And that's, you know, that gets into a lot of the uh, controversy that's been about um, universal injunctions and nationwide injunctions and all that stuff. And uh, different people will, argue about that. So perhaps standing is a mess and thus it has always been. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Uh, we didn't have used to have as much government. So there did, used to be less cases about like, you know, because usually this comes up when it has to do with the government, not just, you know, me suing my neighbor over uh, putting a fence up or, you know, running his truck into my garage or, or what have you. Um, but uh that I think is is part of the reason that it was murky is it didn't used to be quite as big a thing. But that's something libertarians always like to say to to excuse away the past. So uh, we won't get too into that. Well, thank you both for standing with me and uh, 
having the standing discussion. Maybe we'll put a standing date to talk about standing more at a future time where we will stand together. But for now, I would ask that everyone out there stand with me. And in the meantime, that you get engaged. Thank you.